Sir, we can't hold him any longer. He is not guilty. It is impossible for him to be so. We put him under the strongest circle of magic. He did not do it. Bullshit! The captain exclaimed as he charged down the hall towards his prey. He was furious. He was disgusted. But more than anything, he was elated. This time, oh this time, he would have the man dead to rights. The captain of the Royal Mint of Lerionus. Finley Mint had spent years protecting the money of the Emperor's city from thieves and vagabonds. He had set up all the security himself, he had planned every guard duty and had run the banks of the Empire for over two decades. He had been praised by the Emperor on no less than five occasions. Then he had found LaRue. Bank heists were not uncommon in the city. Minty's first acknowledgement from the almighty leader of their world had come from taking down a ringleader of a notorious gang. He had planned the trap so perfectly, not a single copper was stolen. They'd easily got the confessions thanks to the new invention of the mages, the Circle of Truth. Who would have guessed that two decades later, the Circle was now the bane of his existence? He finally reached the interrogation room, only to find that an officer was about to let the scoundrel go. What the hell do you think you were doing? He shouted. The officer looked his way and rolled his eyes. This gave Minch pause. When had he fallen so low in his officer's eyes? Sir, Sergeant Varian said at his side. He said he wasn't the culprit. He said it under the circle of truth. Why are you so sure it is him? Minch ignored the words of the exasperated soldier, instead blasting into the room to look at his foe. Ah, Captain! So good to see you again! How are the kids? The thief called, smiling with such perfectly white teeth. Minch almost punched them there and then just to see if his fist would make them change colour. He had seen this man far too many times at this point. From his greasy brown hair that could keep a fireball burning indefinitely, to those golden eyes that screamed of arrogant intelligence. LaRue had been caught at no less than 10 of the most prolific bank heists in the past 6 months. Every time he had been questioned in the circle of truth, every time he had been allowed to walk free with no evidence to link him to the crime. This was what infuriated Minch. Once was an accident, twice was a coincidence, but Ted? This man was guilty, he knew it. Right from the first time LaRue had been brought into the Mint security, he had been cocky. He didn't even pretend like this phased him, like this was an accident. But there was never any proof to lead him to his conviction. No confession that would come from the perpetrator's mouth. Just a grin that screamed guilty, but with the knowledge that he would walk away yet again. Why did you rob this bank? Minch said, getting right to the report. There was no point in holding back, asking the normal set of questions. They had those on file no less than five times. As I told your wonderful and kind colleagues, I did not rob the bank. Don't lie! LaRue smirked. Minch, Minch, oh Finley Minch. Are we going to play this game all over again? Look at where we're both standing, in this circle of truth. I cannot lie even if I want to. Minch slammed his hands on the table between them in frustration. I know where we are. I know how I sound. I also know you have been here no less than 10 times for 10 bank heists. There is no way you are not guilty. I can only tell you the absolute truth. I was not at the bank to rob it. Mitch's eyebrows furrowed. Why, why were you at the bank? A question so obvious, but somehow he never bothered to ask. He had just trusted the circle to tell him things, never once adding on to the line of questioning. LaRue looked shocked and then smiled. Why, I was completing a transaction for my work, of course. I'm an artist, you see. Probably why you see me at the bank so often. Another dead end. Minch took a deep breath and thought. This man knew how to use words. He knew what to say. It was obvious from how he spoke. But he couldn't deceive, not where they were both standing. Who did rob the bank then? You must have seen someone. No, my dear Minch. I saw no one. 
Lies. Everyone saw two people come in and rob the place. I refuse to believe that you wouldn't have seen anyone. Oh, I saw no one and nothing. LaRue put a bigger grin on his face, infuriating the poor captain more and more. Well, what did you see then? You must have seen something. If not, you are blind. Minchi, I can assure you I am not blind. No one came into the bank. Nothing broke into the bank. No one made off with the money. This made Minch turn to Varian. Do you see? He is somehow lying in the circle. For we know that the bank was indeed robbed. Varian nodded, a questioning look appearing on his face. Maybe there was hope for the sergeant after all, Minch thought. How are you lying? We tested you for magical properties or artifacts before we brought you in here. You are certainly not a mage, Varian asked. I cannot lie, nor is this circle of truth broken. You are both standing in it. Test it for yourself. LaRue just smiled and sat back, waiting for things to unravel like they always did. Minch knew his game. He had started it the fourth time he was brought in. Make the soldiers ask personal questions to each other, and then enjoy the sparks that fly when the two started fighting. It was all a game to this man. Varian opened his mouth when Minch was first speak. Shut your mouth now, Sergeant. I will not be made a fool of again by this stupid tactic. This room hasn't been used since the last time you were brought in here, LaRue. I made sure of it. I had a mage come in and triple check the circle. It is at 100% efficiency. Somehow, you are lying without lying. LaRue just laughed. Can you prove that, O oh almighty captain of the Royal Mint? Although... Word on the street is you'll be losing that title soon. You just confirmed I have yet to speak anything other than the truth. I have already explained I was not in the bank to rob it. That I was there to fulfil my duty as an artist. I told you that I saw nothing and no one. What more is there to tell you other than that? I think it is time you let me go. Wouldn't you agree? No, I wouldn't. There is something about your words that is starting to get to me. You keep using specific phrases, and I think I have it worked out now. Who is no one? This made the smile leave LaRue's face for the first time in all the times he had been brought there. He kept quiet for a good 30 seconds. Munch beamed. At last, got him. LaRue leant forward. I don't know no one. Who is that? He whispered in the captain's ear. Munch lost it, standing up and throwing a chair around the room. Two lesser officers burst in to restrain the captain, very inside as he went to uncuff LaRue. There was no way of getting this conviction. LaRue stood, over-enunciating every action he took, as if to mock Munch, who had deflated, as he had so many times before. The man walked right up to the captain's face and smiled. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain, but you lose again. Good luck next heist. The man was handed a hat and a cane as he walked out of the holding cell, doing a merry jig as he left the poor captain broken and defeated once more. LaRue walked into the sleeping tiger with a spring in his step and a song on his lips. He had always felt good after a confrontation such as that. As he sat down in his usual spot, the barkeeper came over, took one look at the man and sighed. You know, one day I'll stop betting against you, and that's the day you'll get caught, James said. The bar roared into laughter as money started to change hands. This bar knew LaRue's escapades, not how he did them, not what he did, but the fact he kept getting away from the mint was becoming legendary. Did it actually become a worry to LaRue as the heist had gotten more and more knowledgeable? But if there was a place you could trust, it was a den of thieves. Well, to a point. James the Barkeep was actually a liaison to the underground. The bar was a meeting place for the lowest of society. Munch had sent someone to watch over LaRue a few times, but the bar's attitude did a 180 whenever a new person appeared. 
Sure, the clientele may always look rough and tumble, but perfectly gentlemen they were. It was the safest place in the world for the transactions to take place. Usual spot, James inquired, to which he got a nod as LaRue got to his feet, taking his freshly poured ale that he had moored into the private room that was required for what happened next. Once inside, LaRue finally let down his charade. So, how much did you lose this time? He asked, looking the room all down. The importance of the ritual not lost on either man. James smiled. Only a silver this time. Think I'll just remove it from old three-digit Pete's tab. No real damage done. Not after last time. The last time LaRue had got caught, James had bet, as he always did, that this was the time the thief would be caught. He had lost six gold, three silver, and signed to his bar. LaRue would pay compensation to the barkeep. He didn't need to, but it was better to stay on the broker's good side. Besides, after ten successful robberies, he had some cash to float around. The sign wasn't cheap though, and LaRue had made sure to get James to promise he would never bet that high again. A bag of gold appeared in front of the thief. LaRue didn't even look towards it, knowing that the broker wouldn't swindle him, not his most lucrative customer. It was a it was a give and take relationship between them, a friendship of thieves. Next to the bag of stolen goods, James put five sheets of paper. LaRue couldn't help but raise his eyebrows. They all consented to the rules, he asked. James just nodded. Will they all follow the rules? Two sheets were removed from the pile. The two nodded. LaRue would take the cases away to look over how good the other team was. Finally, James sat next to his ally. Come on, ten times I have lost the bet. You gotta tell me how you keep beating the lie detector. It's been six months. It's a true forcer, not a lie detector. Big difference there. And okay, you've been with me all the way. And seeing as this is likely the last time I can get away with it, sure. This made James' eyes widen. Last time, Munch getting better? LaRue nodded. He's nearly there, and that sergeant today has changed their tune. They'll work together next time, find the cracks. Once they do, the game is over. So tell me, oh mighty Barky, what are my three rules? James stood to attention and smiled. One, no names will be given to any other party, except code names given out by you. Two, the client and the liar will never meet face to face before or after the heist. During the heist, they must conceal their identities from the liar with a black nondescript mask. Three, they will not acknowledge the liar as taking part in the heist, nor will they ask him to carry anything or do anything in relation to the theft. If these can all be agreed, the liar will take the fall for the case, giving the thieves ample time to escape. Lou smiled, looking at the closest thing he had to a friend the underworld could provide. Excellent. At least I know you're telling the people the correct things. New question. For two gold pieces, why do I have those rules? The barkeep gave a grin. Isn't that obvious? Anonymity is a thief's best friend. Lurie threw his arms into an X. Bebe! Oh, sorry! That was an incorrect answer. The correct answer is to beat the circle of truth. I can easily break it down using Munch's questions from today. So come, sit, pour me some beer as I regale you with the story of how to confuse the police with a few small ideas. James sat. Larue knew his drinks wouldn't be ending anytime soon. So, let's start with Munch's first question after his wonderful entrance to the stage. At this, the man puffed up his chest, put on a face of annoyance and changed his voice, all in ways to mock his foe. Why did you rob this bank? He asked me. Now, question three. Did I rob the bank? This made James tilt his head. I mean, you were there as part of the heist, so yes. Tut, tut, tut. I thought even you would have been able to work this out. The answer is, I did not rob the bank. That would have broken rule three of my three rules. I never touched the money, nor am I there as part of the heist. My goal is to get caught. That's it. The fact that there is a robbery happening around me just happens to be a lucky coincidence that you managed to set up. See, truth is all about perspective. 
in my eyes, I never planned to rob the place. My game is far above that. Next, after some blustering, he noticed my choice of words. Why were you at the bank? He inquired. Now, what answer could I give that would not give my game away? But you said you were there to get caught. That was your perspective of the situation. Using your own logic, you should have faltered there. Excellent! The monkey is learning! Indeed, perspective alone cannot free you from the madness of the circle of truth. Instead, your freedom to choose your words comes into play. My goal is to put on a performance. To fool the officers. Therefore, my answer was clear. Why, I was completing a transaction for my work, of course. I'm an artist, you see. Probably why you see me in the bank so often. He could have tripped me up if he had just followed this line of questioning. In fact, all it would have taken him was to ask about my art. But the lemons who live in their ivory towers have yet to understand the use of poking and prodding the answers out of a person. LaRue saw that he was losing his audience. He could not blame James, really. It was the act of making your mind think in a completely different way. The circle of truth wouldn't let you lie. But equally, it was fallible. LaRue was just smart enough to see the cracks. Who did rob the bank then? You must have seen someone. He continued in his mocking munch. This made James's eyes light up. Now, this one I get. You never meet the clients. You never hear their names. You decide their code names. No one and nothing. You were playing on words here. The answer is something like, I saw nothing, right? Ding, ding, ding. LaRue jumped out of his chair laughing as he did. See, James, that is why I can trust you to decide who to pick. Smart man right here. Is is that why you call me James? You know that's not my real name. Indeed. I use concealment and perspective to mask what I explain. Sure, I saw the people robbing the place, but a clever application of rule one and no one is any the wiser. Even if my lies are caught, you will not be. Which brings me to the final question. And the thing that made me realise the game is almost over. A simple question, but an important one. They know my code names now. I'll have to change it up a little. Who is no one? He managed to almost get me to slip up. The thief swung his arms wide, revelling in the latest development. The thrill of it all that I had anticipated this as well. That I could watch hope grow and crumble. Oh, it excites me like no other. Rule 2. I never meet my clients before or after. With them wearing things that mask their face, I cannot even give the smallest idea who they are. Who is no one? I have no clue. James looked and sounded, as he should before LaRue's magnificence. It was the perfect plan. Sure, there were actually holes, but ten robberies in a row? It was unheard of. You say that they are close. So why are you getting ready for the next one? You have enough money from the previous robberies. You can disappear into the night at this point. Lurie turned and looked his compatriot deep in his eyes. This was never about money, he exclaimed. Dig Barkeep the first time was partly, but it was mostly for the challenge. I thought of ending it there and then. But on that day, I met Munch. He was pompous, arrogant, and so trusting in his little magic circle that I enjoyed beating him with my words. That's what brought me back the second time, and the third. You ask why I don't take my earnings and run? Simple. Munch and I are playing a game of chicken. We are both trying to get the other to lose before we do. He is so close to losing his job, you know. The question is now, who will win? Will I be hung or will he be fired? Neither of us can simply walk out of this game now. It would kill us both to do so. So no, I must see this game through to its conclusion. I must know who the rightful winner is. And if it's me, then I'll take a much needed vacation. If it is much though, well, I will be having a longer sleep than I intended. The beginning weeks have been uneventful, honestly. I never have the motivation to work at home. I work best when I'm out of my house. 
which is why I brought my quote unquote work laptop. But with the snow, the virus that shall not be named, and the stress of the time of the year, it contract renewals for my work, you know. I haven't had the energy to do much with the book at the moment. I have around 330 pages to read through. The book likely won't be that long, but I have edited it to make sure it is easy to work with, and I have got through 100 pages now. But it is slow and monotonous to find all my mistakes. I have been making notes for draft 2. Without giving much away, I need to build awareness of certain minor points that are important for later in the story. I am also getting a feel for the narrator's part. I chose not to write most of his openings because the story was developing and I didn't want to go back and realise that he is completely off the mark. I did that in the world creation arc and it wasn't worth it looking back. Now the story is set, I can see what the narrator needs to say and think a little better. I'm going to be out of the house a lot more after this week is done so there will be plenty of time for editing after that. So hopefully a better update when the next video rolls about. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. It would be a great help for a small writer such as myself and I'd be ever so grateful.